really glad to be here. It's been a very long and exhausting journey. Uh, before I begin uh, my talk, I want to emphasize two things. One is that the, what I'll talk about is not unique to Israel. Such things happen in many places in the world where there are national conflicts. So Israel didn't really invent those kind of things. Um, and the second is uh, sometimes viewing the conflict from uh, the outside, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there's a tendency to divide the sides um, into victims and victimizers. And of course, the power relations between Israel and uh, Palestinians is far from being balanced. But um, leaving the, the, the conflict from the inside, things are much more complex. And uh, victims are on both sides in different ways of the, the conflict. And I want to quote Professor Alon Confino from University of Virginia. He's a historian. He said, uh, I would aspire for a history of 48 that seeks not to blame, score points, and divide the world into clear-cut perpetrators and victims, but instead acknowledges the complexity of human affairs and that perpetrator and victim can be united in the same person. Holocaust survivors ended up expelling Arabs. Arabs denying the humanity of Jews ended up uprooted refugees. So a little about myself and what brought me to deal with those issues. Uh, I grew up in Jerusalem to a Jewish-Israeli family. And uh, I was working for years in human rights organization, documenting human rights violation Israel commits to Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And this work led me to want to know more about the conflict, to understand the roots of the conflict. The refugee camps, for example, in the West Bank, what are those places? Where the, uh, did those people come from? And I began to study for a master, master's program focusing on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I learned things that they are obvious to me now and, and to you, but at the time came as a surprise. For example, that when I hear about um, Palestinians in Lebanon and, and in Jordan, these are, this is not another ethnic group in those countries, but these are people that came from where I live, maybe even the same neighborhood in Jerusalem. And they realize that we use their lands, we use their houses, and we don't really talk about them. And um, that really, buzzed me and I wanted to explore more this encounter between Israelis and the Palestinian um, villages and property that was left behind. And I get to know better the pl the, their places. Um, I, I travel a lot in Israel and I ran to those places all the time where there are remains of the Palestinian communities from 48. Uh, Lifta is an example of village in the outskirts of Jerusalem. As a child, they took us often there to, um, with school, with the youth movement, with the family to, to travel, to uh, swim in the pool, to crawl in a tunnel, and to walk in the ruins. And as a child, my perception of the place was as if it was always empty and ruined and silent. And only later I could uh, realize that not so long ago it was home to a community of people, families, children, agricultural activity. And now there's nothing of that, and, and no reminder uh, for, the, for this, not even a sign that says what was there before. So I devote my research to the encounter between Israelis and the Palestinian villages. I did it in four uh, aspects. The, the names that uh, Israel is giving or not giving to the, those places, uh, whether Israel puts them on the maps, villages in tourist areas in Israel, how they are being, uh, what information is being said about them to the public. And, uh, and the last is Jewish community built over remains of Palestinian villages. I'll give a short historical background that you might be familiar with. So before 48, Palestine was a predominantly Arab country, Palestinian country. There was a growing Jewish minority it grew since the 19th century, and especially in the 20th century, uh, with the growing persecution of Jews in Europe, where Jews felt that they don't have place anymore in Europe and Russia, and tried to find um, refuge elsewhere. Some uh, moved to the United States, some to Australia, and some to, to Palestine, and with the emergence of the Zionist uh, national movement. Um, but still, in the, in the, before the, the war in 48, the Palestinians were still the majority. 
I won't go into the, all what that happened during the war, but the result of the war, the striking result of the war, that the, popula the population composition of the country completely changed. That most Palestinians found themselves refugees across the borders of uh, the newly established Israel. And they lost everything they had, around 750,000 of them. They became refugees because uh, they, they were fleeing from their houses mostly because uh, of attacks against their communities or nearby their communities or occupation of nearby cities, uh, sometimes direct deportations by Israeli forces. And the, um, they found themselves in Lebanon, Syria, the West Bank, Gaza Strip, uh, Jordan. And this sequ sequence of events is called by the Palestinians the Nakba, their catastrophe. The refugees, the Palestinian refugees, have to leave, had to leave behind uh, hundreds of communities that, be, that stayed empty after the war. Among them, are over 400 villages. Israel confiscated all this property, lands, houses, everything, and declared it as uh, absentee property. It became state property. And over the, this, uh, on these refugee lands, Israel built new communities and settled uh, Jews and immigrants immigrants. The policy of Israel regarding the villages was um, for the most part to demolish them. Some of them were demolished already during the war um, for military reasons, but um, many were, were not demolished as part of the, of the battles, but demolished later. Israel decided um, after the war not to allow the return of the, of the refugees. This was a parliament decision it was not uh, obvious at the time. There was some controversy uh, uh, around this uh, question, but this was a decision. And one of the ways to implement um, the, refu the refusal to allow them to return was to demolish their houses. The idea was that if we demolish their houses, they, they will at some point build houses elsewhere and, and go on with their life and, and forget about their old, old communities. Later on, even in the 60s, many remains of the villages were still in the landscape of Israel, and uh, Israel tried to get rid of, of those remains for aesthetical reasons. It, it was considered something that uh, uglified the landscape, is not part of the landscape that, that we want to create, and uh, also a reminder for something that we don't want to talk about. Uh, leaders said that tourists might go around and uh, look for, uh, see the ruins and ask questions, and, we, we don't want that. So there was also a big demolition project in the 60s. And the result is uh, that the villages are, for the most part, demolished. And here and there, you can see remains, like fences, uh, sometimes collapsing structures, cacti bushes, orchard trees. And those places are now part of the landscapes in, in Israel. The first thing I checked is uh, whether those places have official names in Israel. In Israel, there is an official uh, names committee that is, is responsible to give official names to any feature on the ground, mountains, rivers, and also ruins. Now, this is not just a, a technical thing to give names. It's, a, it's like an arena in a conflict, and it's a common practice when a, a nation occupies territory, to give its own names, to force its own names over the territory and to erase the former names. Um, it, it's a way to declare your uh, ownership, your new ownership over the place, and, and to put your own cultural content through the names. And that was what happened also here. The general policy of the names committee was to try to revive ancient names, biblical names, uh, that once uh, those places carried, and uh, with the generation were forgotten. And to erase the Arabic names, which were considered uh, foreign names. And of course, this was a, a, a political act, as uh, we can see from some quotes of officials. The Names Committee said that the, he the historical Hebrew names of the places of the land in Israel are the most faithful testimony that these places belong to our forefathers since time immemorial and our rights and claims on these places and the land are ancient historical ones. 
And Ben Gurion, the first prime minister, said, we must remove the Arabic name due to political considerations. Just as we do not recognize the political ownership of Arabs over the land, we do not recognize their spiritual ownership and their names. Now, regarding the, the populated villages, the, name, the names committee members at first didn't know what to do because they're supposed to give names to any feature on the ground, but these are places that were intentionally demolished by Israel. So should we give, give them them or, or not? There, is, there was a delay in the work of the names committee because of this um, question, and eventually Ben Gurion decided that we should give names to ruins of villages, that it's in, important, it's necessary to include in the map. And by that he meant uh, villages that were built over more ancient sites, often Jewish ancient sites, that we do want to name. But other villages that didn't have such a history were not named. And therefore, uh, eventually what happened that most villages, that even uh, villages that stood uh, and had names for hundreds of years, the names were erased. They're not recognized as official names. Um, and only a minority of the villages received official names. But also those names, the official names were not the Arabic original names of the villages, but uh, Hebraized names that were given to them. Uh, in some cases, it was the ancient names that uh, the, the committee thought they identify from biblical time. In other places, it was um, they changed the Arabic names so that they will sound more Hebrew uh, to a name that sometimes doesn't have even meaning in Hebrew but carries a Hebrew sound. In other places, they translated the Arabic name. Um, and only very few villages have their original names, Arabic names, as official names. And in this case, those names also have meaning in Hebrew. The Names Committee understood that it's not enough to give new names. You have also to con convince the public to use the new names. Because the, when Israel was first established, most of, most of the residents were, uh, were immigrants, Jewish refugees, that didn't know the places. And they, they, they used the names that they knew, usually the names of the Arab villages around. And the, the Names Committee went out of his way to, se to send information about the new names to um, the media, to institution, uh, educational institutions, municipalities, and urging the public to use the new names and, and to forget the old ones. For example, they wrote to a children, children's magazine, your newspaper is commanded to fulfill also the following mission. In addition to the love of the homeland, plant in the hearts of the children the knowledge of the language of the homeland. Hebrew names instead of Arabic ones. You do not always insist on that, and the Arabic names appear on more than one occasion. They wrote to the bus company that put in its bus station signs of the Arabic former names instead of the new Hebrew names that were assigned to those places. Your insistence on the Arabic names is neither commandable nor legal. You are failing the public and misleading it with names that have been, been completely and decisively abolished. You are interfering with the stealing of the Hebrew names. Eventually, um, the mission of the Names Committee succeeded, and today the Arabic names for the most part are forgotten, and the new names that the Names Committee gave to the places are the ones that they use. So Israel won also in this arena, thanks to its military victory over, over the Palestinians. So by erasing the names of the villages, Israel also erases their memories and condemns them to be forgotten. One of the reasons uh, of the work of the Names Committee was to create a Hebrew map. When Israel was established, just before it was uh, established, the, the maps that was used, the maps that were used, were British official maps. The British collected from the local population, the Palestinian population, the names that were in use, Arabic names, thousands of names of rivers, or streams, and mountains, and put them on the maps and villages, of course. 
And at first, when Israel was uh, established, Israel used the British maps. But the British maps couldn't serve well uh, Israel. First, uh, th th they were not Hebrew. They were not Hebrew maps like Israel wanted to use. And also, they show the um, realities that no longer exist. They show many villages that were demolished from the ground. So what Israel did uh, in the first year was to use the British maps with a uh, uh, print that updates the, the new reality. Near the, the old Arab villages that were demolished, they put a sign demolished, and they put on the, new, on the map the new settlement that they were built on the village's lands. Only later on, uh, Israel, when the names committee finished to give Hebrew names to all the places in Israel, Israel uh, produced official Hebrew maps. And I, I checked those maps to see if the villages are, are marked on them. Because uh, every feature on the ground is supposed to be marked on the maps, including ruins. So I want to see if Israel, I, I checked those hiking maps that are popular among uh, Israeli when they travel, uh, if, they, if they use them, if they see uh, those villages marked on the map. I, I, I found that uh, around 40% of the villages are not marked at all. Uh, and many others are marked only by a sign, usually a sign of a ruin, which doesn't tell you if it was from, from where, when the place was ruined and by who. It could be a Roman ruin as well. And 64% uh, of the villages don't have their names on the map. And those that do have the names, it's usually the, the Hebrew name. So all, all of the map don't reflect the presence of the Palestinian villages in Israel even though the, those maps show many historical places that don't, no longer exist um, from more ancient times. And there are also villages that, show that, is, that left considerable remains on the ground, like it is in the photo. Uh, are, are not are not shown on the map. Putting all the villages on the on the maps, like here. These are my my marks. So like I put the villages <coughs> on the map. They were not there originally. Uh, that enabled me to to see that today how many villages are now within nature reserve, national parks, and other recreational. Uh, areas in Israel, and I found that almost half of the villages are now within such sites. Some of it is because many Palestinian villages were built on more ancient sites, and those places were declared national parks to preserve the ancient history of the place, so the Palestinian villages found themselves in the national parks. And in other, in other cases, many Palestinian villages were built near springs and streams, and those places became nature reserves. And now, now the Palestinian remains are inside those reserves. So I want to check when Israelis visit those places, what information they receive by the authorities that run those places. If they receive information that there was a Palestinian village here, and what kind of information they, they receive about it. The, the two main bodies that run those places are the JNF, the Jewish National Fund, that is responsible for <coughs> A recreation of forests in Israel, and the um, a par Parks Authority, Na National Park Authority, that is responsible for nat nature reserves and national parks. I went to all those places, and I read the signs, the information that is uh, put on the signs, and the information in the brochure that are distributed to the public. What I found is that in most cases, the authorities ignore the villages altogether. Or there are signs and brochures that don't say anything about the village, or they, are, they didn't put any sign near the village remains. Here is an example. It's a brochure of Ramat Menashe Park, south of Haifa. 
Um, it tells you the general description of the park, that it has planted in natural forest, open space, gentle slopes, fields and orchards, um, sites of heritage and settlements, which means Jewish sites, archaeological findings, and they don't mention seven villages that used to stand right in the place where the park is now. I marked them in yellow, they were not marked on the map originally. When there is, in the minority of cases, when there is reference to the village, it's, it's done uh, very briefly, abruptly, uh, without giving details about the village, like how long it used to stand there, what the people did for their living, how many people used to live the, there, what happened to them in 48. Villages are sometimes mentioned uh, just as villages, not as Arabs, and never as Palestinians, sometimes without the name of the village. Sometimes there is a folkloristic mention of the village, uh, talking about the tradition, the religious customs of the villagers, without describing what happened to the village in 48. For example, in the village of Kubeba, the texts talk about the demon tree, the only tree remaining on the hill, probably due to its sanctity to the residents of Kubeba, an Arab village that stood uh, by the hill until 48. According to the legend, the villagers of Kubeba would send their children to bring water from the well, and to make sure they came back quickly, would tell them a demon lived on the plum tree guarding the water. Bringing water from the well does become the test of courage for the village children. And the text doesn't, doesn't say what happened to the village children in 48 and why the village stood there only in until 48. Sometimes the texts talk about the structure that remained from the village without telling that they used to belong to a, a specific village. For example, in the Kafir Birem, now within Baram National Park, the text advises uh, leaving the synagogue and walking up the nearby hill topped with a Maronite church. Try identifying the animal on the lintel. Did you guess? It's the kangaroo which carries its offspring in its pouch and protects them as the church protects its followers. We will then ascend the building in front of the church for a spectacular vista of the Moron Mountain nature reserve all around us. The text doesn't mention that the refugees of Kafir Birim are, since 48 they live only a few kilometers away, they are Israeli citizens, and, and since 48, they demand the right to return to their village, and even the Supreme Court, Israeli Supreme Court, approved this right, uh, but, but the state didn't implement it till now. The texts tend to focus on Jewish history, often while neglecting the uh, hundreds of years of Palestinian history in the same place. Uh, this is a, a place called Sataf. It used to be a Palestinian village and also a an an more ancient place. And uh, today the JNF runs this place and leases plots of lands from the village uh, to Israelis who come to grow vegetables in their free time. And the text says that, uh, talk about these two springs that water agricultural terraces, a reminder of, of an almost vanished ancient Hebrew culture thousands of years old. Here, just like the ancient Israelites at the, at the time, People tend irrigated vegetable garden along, alongside orchards that require no irrigation. This is a tough, a hidden gem, as it has stopped the time from passing. In many of the JNF forests, there are commemoration stones for uh, Jewish communities perishing the Holocaust or um, donors from abroad that donate to the, to the JNF. And the, there is never any commemoration for the Palestinian villages, even if those stones are put right where the, the Palestinian village was. Uh, and sometimes those stones are, are taken from the remains of the Palestinian structures that were demolished. The texts talk about the, the places as a, a picturesque, with natural beauty, without talking about the villages in them. In Caramel Coast Forest, for example, the texts talk about one of the most magical places in the country with many spots and grace of beauty, magical atmosphere like a fairy tale, uh, wraps, wraps the community, the Jewish communities of Kerem, Maral, and Ofer. And they don't mention three villages that uh, are under the trees that used to stand there before. Sometimes the texts talk about the remains of the villages as part of this natural beauty. They talk about the ruins of the village and Razal as adorning the slopes and the, the populated village of Kudna as a picturesque ruin. 
in many of uh, the villages, the orchard trees remain, and in, in, uh, in the touristic places, the tourist authorities cultivate the orchards as part of the landscape of the, of the park. And the text described those, those uh, orchards, often without telling that this was a source of uh, li livelihood and income for the villagers. Uh, a text uh, of JNF even, even talks about a flora unit which is extraordinary in its vitality and importance, the abandoned orchards that tend to grow beneath terraces, without mentioning the villages that those orchards used to belong to. The texts often talk about 48 and the uh, battles as part of what is in Israel is um, called battle legacy, which uh, is, is important to deliver information about past wars to the younger generations. But in this context, the Palestinian villages are uh, described either as targets for occupation or as hostile and violent against Jews and Israelis. And they don't give any information about the population circumstances, why those places ceased to exist, what happened to the, the villagers after the war. In the village of Deir el Hawa, the JNF text says that the village was occupied by the Palmachar El Brigade during Operation Mountain. A visit to the mountain at sunset is astonishingly beautiful. The texts don't, don't mention attacks against villages, uh, massacre cases when those happened, deportation cases, and so on. In the, the village of Kisaria, the sign only says that the village did not last for long. In the, the village of Zaytun, for example, in the Galilee, according to historian Benny Morris, Palmach units expelled women, elderly, and children by shooting over the heads. Around 70 men from the village and other villages nearby were gunned down into a nearby creek, their hands tied, following instruction of a local battalion commander. Meanwhile, Palmach units blew up and burned houses in the village. All this doesn't appear on the sign of JNF in the, in, near the remains of the village, which, which only says that the in this context that the village was a base for our fighters and was occupied by the Palmach. The text uh, also never explain why the village turned into a ruin uh, and by whom and when, even, even though it is obvious from what visitors see around them that the place was demolished. The last thing I, I I'll talk about is the um, Jewish communities built over Palestinian villages. In the, in, in the first few years of Israel, some uh, 700,000 Jewish immigrants came to the country, mostly refugees themselves, either Holocaust survivors from uh, Europe or Jews from Arab countries that were forced to live and, and all had to leave all, all they had and their houses behind. There were around the same number of Palestinian refugees. Around a third of those immigrants settled in Arab empty houses, the populated houses in the cities, and villages that were, were annexed to cities, to Israeli cities. Um, and in 49, there was an initiative in the government to also to use the property in the villages, the Palestinian villages, to house immigrants, Jewish immigrants. Uh, in around uh, 70 such villages, they make um, some repair, construction, and establish new Jewish communities. In most of those places were abandoned after some, uh, a, a year or two. The condition of living with the immigrants in those places were very difficult. The places were, sometimes the houses were falling apart with no doors and windows, no electricity, no running water. Um, it was often far from cities, it was far to find work there, it was sometimes near border areas where Palestinians were trying to come back to their uh, locations and take belongings and there was some tension around that. Uh, so some, those who could often move to other places. And also at some point the um, settlement um, establishment in Israel decided that this was not a good idea, that actually the Arab village cannot serve as the, to, to create our vision of the new modern Jewish agricultural community, because the way it is built, cluttered and, and um, 
crowded houses. So, it's a, so most of those places, they took the people out, they built new houses for them one or two miles away, and demolished the villages. But still in around 40 um, places, people remained till now in Jewish communities, right on the places where the Palestinian villages used to stand. Sometimes uh, still in the Arab houses that were uh, renovated and reconstructed since. And I was wondering how the people who live in these places and the people who came in 49 to live in the Arab hu empty houses, uh, how they saw this reality um, of living in houses that used to belong to others are now refugees and can't even visit. I went to, I read a publication of 25 such communities. I went to archives of, of kibbutzim and moshavim, of Jewish agricultural communities, um, and I read the newsletters and the anniversary books and websites and uh, saw how they relate to the villages. I found that, that um, in all the publication, they mentioned the fact that their community was established over an Arab village. This is a well-known fact for them, uh, obvious, and they always mention it. For example, Kibbutz Sasa, built on the village of Sasa. In the Sasa ID, they say the name Kibbutz Sasa, birthplace, the abandoned village of Sasa. And Moshav, um, Kerem Ben Zimra says in its general review that the Moshav was built on the ruins of the Arab village of Ras el Ahma. And such description appear in all publications. But other than that, they rarely talk about the village itself, uh, about its population, about the people, uh, what they did for the living, what happened to them in 48, and all other details. The main um, references to villages is to the property um, that, that the new Jewish community used of the Palestinian village, mainly the houses and the um, orchards. Kibbutz Iron, for example, talk about the Arab stone homes that are serving us faithfully. We've refurbished 17 residential rooms and some 10 service structures in the building, buildings of the village of Saliha, which we refurbished for their temporary usage and named their own. In Kibbutz Beit Guvin, they show um, a remnant of the Arab village, that they don't even mention the name, of the village that served as a laundry room for the kibbutz. In some places there were even um, important Arab house, that they called, as they called it, that uh, had a special role in the history of the kibbutz. Usually it was the only structure that was left from the village, and when the, um, vi when the people from the kibbutz established the place, they usually uh, we're living in, those, in this house and used it, and um, they talk about it in a nostalgic way in their writings. Uh, Moshav Abonim, for example, talks about the Mukhtar's house. The Mukhtar is the leader of the village. That has changed role of the, over the years. The general kitchen became the volunteer's kitchen, the carpentry camp, workshop, a club, a storeroom, a sewing workshop, and the houses remain the nerve center of the Moshav. Kibbutz Megiddo even devoted a poem to, to the Arab village of the kibbutz. It says, when we came here in February 49, we looked at your house to find a spark of hope and a gl glimmer of light. You, the one and only, whom we call the Arab house, for without you, we would be lost and as the homeless. When the new residents came to the villages, they found the orchards of the Palestinians and they tried to, to tend them and to have income from them. And they write a lot about those attempts in the writings, because it was not easy for them. They didn't know how to cultivate olive trees. They put a lot of effort in it. And they talk about the orchard as, as their own, not as, as someone that, uh, something that someone had to leave behind. In Kibbutz El, for example, they talk about the Beijing's grove that looks lovely. The olive bloom is gradually turning into fruit. It seems a large crop is forthcoming. Our groves are the most beautiful in the area. We, accept, we expect serious income from the grove. In, in Kibbutz Beta Emek, which is in the photo, the kibbutz even develop a special tradition where the youth of the kibbutz 
uh, harvest the olive trees every year. And with this money, they help to fund their route trip to, to Poland to visit concentration camps um, in Poland. And the decision of the kibbutz was that the, the olives are the property of the kibbutz entrusted to the youth to sponsor the Poland <coughs> project. Other reference to the villages in the writings of Kibbutzim and Moshavim is their aspiration to Judaize the village, to turn it from Arab to Jewish, uh, to turn it from a deserted, neglected place to a blooming place, and to change the Arab landscape, which is considered something negative. I didn't find many references to how people felt living in a place that used to belong to others. But so in some kibbutzim, there are references to feelings of discomfort or pain. For example, Kibbutz Iron, they wrote, when we reached the place where Iron was to be established, the Arab village induced a gloomy mood in me. It was a place that one could see has been abandoned not so long ago, and many houses displayed signs of looting. In Kibbutz Kabri, established on the village of El Kabri, they wrote, when you see what happened to the Arab village of Kabri, which stood where it did for hundreds of years and was home to people and children, and here it stands devastated and desolate and all its residents scattered all over, your heart aches and you feel how negative, tragic this is. The, the residents of Kabri, by the way, they also had to leave their original kibbutz, which was near the Dead Sea, uh, because of the war, because it became Jordanian territory. And they were also recognized as refugees by the UN. And they established their new kibbutz in uh, El Kabri, where, where there used to be a, a Palestinian village. In Kibbutz Sasa, they wrote, here we were, American Jewish pioneers, come to help build a new homeland and create a new society. We were bred on American fair play and a Shomer Tzair by nationalism living in harmony with our Arab brothers. It was bad enough living in the village where you could almost feel their presence, where part of their possessions were left behind, where their storerooms filled with last season's crop. If all this was not enough to burst our ideological bubble, there was the problem of what to do with the mosque. When they came to live in the, in the houses of the Palestinians, the, the mosque was still there, and the army, the Israeli army pushed, pushed them to get rid of the mosque. And um, they were divided amongst this, themselves. Some said that they cannot do this. This is not theirs, their own. Uh, and some says, said that um, we use our houses anyway. We're, they're not going to come back. Why, why do we need to keep the mosque for? And eventually, the army just demolished the mosque without waiting for their decision. And Kibbutz Asa was the only kibbutz that I found that uh, devoted a lot of time and, and energy to discussion about the moral dilemma that they saw in living in a place of uh, the populated villages, its residents turned turn refugees. They, they wrote a lot about it in their, in their publications and newsletters. And they even devoted the, the Haggadah, the traditional book for Passover, to the suffering of the, of the refugees. The part of its tradition is traditionally devoted to the um, suffering of the Jewish, uh, the Jewish slaves in Egypt, and is symbolized by the bitter herb. In their version of the Agadai, it goes, our herb is a very bitter one, and even if we should succeed in removing all other physical traces of it, its taste will linger. Once there was an Arab village here. The fields we tend today were tended by others one year ago. And when we came, the desolation of their lives cried to us through the ruins they left behind. What gives us the right, the right to reap the fruits of trees we have not planted, to take shelter in houses we have not built, to till the soil preserved by the sweat of foreign hands? On what moral ground shall we stand when we take ourselves to court? But uh, eventually, the people of Sasa remained in the village, as other communities did. And the different uh, communities gave different justification to why they think it's fine to live in the populated our village. Some says that they, it's, it was, it's their fault, the Palestinian fault. They chose to flee. In the Kibbutz Karmia, for example, they said that there were homes here, Arab hats, actually. It did not bother me. They fled. It was their fault. They had listened to the Mufti, to their leader, 
and I do not pity them. Uh, others saw it as a matter of self-defense. We, we were not responsible to, to this contradiction, but we have been forced into a position where we, might, where we must fight for our lives and the lives of our people. And today life is largely determined by frontiers, and frontiers must be defended no matter what the price. And the other side is a result of our, our violence. In Kibbutz Kabri, they said that, in fact, the village was abandoned by its residents after a murderous attack <coughs> by the locals on the convoy trying to break uh, through the siege on Kibbutz Ichiam. Maybe some of the villagers did not support the action and did not take an active part of it. But when the fire begins to burn, it burns everything damp and dry. So the moral dilemmas that I saw in Kibbutz Sasa were, were the exception to the rule. And generally, the, the Jewish community is accepted in the writing the fact that they live in um, places that were depopulated and um, confiscated from their original owners. But um, it's, it, we have to take into consideration, and it's very obvious from their, uh, from their writings that those people were themselves refugees for the most part and they, they write a lot and they dealt a lot with trying to build a new life for themselves uh, instead of the, the lives they had to leave behind. Um, and this didn't leave probably much room for them to see the loss of the others. And maybe it's not coincidence that the communities that did talk and they uh, dealt a lot with the um, more con contradiction was kibbutz Sasa that were established by members of the United States uh, that were not forced to leave, but they chose to come, and um, they were not perse persecuted, and perhaps this enabled them to, to have a place also to think about the loss of the Palestinians. So generally, in all the aspects of the research that I did, I, I found erasure and marginalization of the memory of the Palestinian villages in the from the Israeli awareness. And the result is that the picture of Israel is, is of their country is of a, a predominantly Jewish country with very minor Palestinian geography and history. And this didn't happen by itself. It happened through different mechanisms that mediate between Israelis and the, their countries, like the JNF and the Nature Parts Authority and, and NAMES Committee and other um, institutions like that, that convey the, the Zionist narrative to the Israelis and shape their national identity accordingly. And those messages are delivered to Israelis when they do daily activities like um, tra traveling, having picnic in nature, uh, using maps, using place names. And in, in this way, the um, erasure of the villages from the consciousness of Israelis complements the, the erasure from the ground. And of course, it has political implications that the, there is a very minor awareness of Israelis to the tragedy of, of uh, the Palestinian experience in 48 and to their loss and to the, the price they pa paid for the establishment of Israel. And I don't, I don't uh, try to put solutions for the, the conflict, but I think in order to try to achieve um, sustainable, long-lasting conflict, it is necessary that we will open our eyes to what happened in '48 and take responsibility to our part in what happened and um, acknowledge the loss of the Palestinians and try to find redress and a future of reconciliation. Thank you, I'll be happy to hear comments and questions.
remember, uh, I teach, by the way, at uh, Cornell School of International Studies. Uh, uh, I was a graduate student at Cornell, uh, uh, and I- Continue to speak up. We cannot hear you back here. <laughs> okay, we all stand and speak. <laughs> that would be is, that, is that better? Thank you. <coughs> okay, so uh, 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 I went to two talks, I remember, one given by uh, Israelis, one given by Palestinians, and they basically showed the same, at that time it was black and white picture, your pictures are much better. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Israelis were presenting their side, as, uh, basically saying, look how we develop this land. Uh, that was the narrative, and uh, uh, the Palestinians were, of course, uh, uh, pointing at the disaster from their sides. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, you know, one way to look at your, your narrative is to say, okay, you know, uh, history is really nothing but the record of crimes and misfortunes uh, of humans, as Voltaire once said. Uh, uh, but there is a human side, of course. Uh, uh, in this, even if that view is true, and that's not entirely true. Uh, it seems that uh, great historical misfortunes occurred on both sides, uh, and uh, subsequent history doesn't help. Uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, uh, what uh, uh, do you hope to achieve, or your book can achieve, regardless of what you hope to achieve, uh, uh, in at least creating a dialogue? people and perhaps finding some common solutions. Uh, secondly, personally, when you give such talk in Israel, uh, what are the reactions? Okay. Yeah, by the way, the book was published first in Hebrew in Israel a few years ago, and later was translated. So what I, what I want to try to achieve, um, what I said, that I believe that the, as Israelis were obliged to look at, at our past in, in, a more, in a more brave way. Um, both because it's uh, intellectually, uh, this is part of our history and it is part of, of the geography of our country and I, I think we should be aware of that. And, and this is not the case, we, people don't study, children don't study about it it's in schools. And the information is there, so someone who is interested will, will know all the details. But the average person who goes to school and listens to the news is totally not aware and very ignorant about that. And I think, I think it's bad. I think we live in a situation and we still live the conflict today and we have to understand more better how it began and how it still affects pe people's lives. And this is a major part of it. And it's also a moral thing because it's not just something theoretical. We use, we use our property. We, we, are, we have the privilege we, we, were, we built our country over their remains. So it's our moral obligation to take responsibility for that and, and to try to uh, find regret for those people who lost those things. In Israel, I, I gave talks in many places, and always the, the reactions were very good. Doesn't mean that all the Israelis support these kind of things, not at all. But the people who come to those things are the first place peace brother are supportive and interested. But no, the, generally the atmosphere in Israel is totally not in favor of such initiatives. Um, by the way, it's not completely true because I, some people, refugees from Europe, they were offered Palestinian houses when they came, when they immigrated to Israel, and they refused. They said, they realized that this is a house of refugees, and they said, that we cannot do that. This what they did to us in Germany, they took our house, we cannot do the same. So some people, did. but most of them were just trying to survive, and um, they, they came, this was, what was the option, and this what they did. Um, so, some, some, I guess, were less aware, and some were more aware, but uh, I think they didn't really think they have many options, um, and they just felt that they need to, to build themselves. And 
And also p part of the, for some people, some part of the lessons from the Holocaust was we will not allow this to happen to us again. So we do what we, we were thrown from there. This is where we build ourselves now. We do what, whatever it takes. And uh, if, if somebody else paid the price, it's too bad. But we don't want to pay the price again ourselves. And, and this was one of the main justification. It's either us or them. If, it, if we didn't do that to them, they would do uh, this to us and even worse. We will all be killed. Uh, so yeah, it's not nice, and these things happen in wars, and we wish we didn't have to do that. But uh, it, it was a, a, a war for life and death, and, and this was really the perce perception of people in '48 among the Jews. I can also my grandparents remember that that, that we, they didn't know if they will survive this at all, or there will be a, another Holocaust, and there will be. So yeah, the the idea was, and, this, and it's still the justification that this, this is a matter of survival, and we, we have to do we had to do it. Uh, you mentioned you were a member of a humanitarian NGO, or previously were which which NGO did you work with? Yeah, human rights organizations, uh, different ones. I worked with Betelem. Uh, uh, Sorry? Didn't their offices in Jerusalem get firebombed a couple of months back? Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, okay. but no, no, but the, but the police investigation says that it, this was an electrical um, sh uh, shock. Shortage? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no one broke into the office uh, and lit a fire. So it was an electrical Yeah. Um, How so it happened, I don't know. But I assume in your capacity you've worked with uh, members of the Knesset. Uh, what has been your experience in dealing with hardliners, and particularly what sort of ideological approach do they take to this issue in, in the Israeli government? In the government, more and more in the last few years, there's big opposition to such attempts. Um, and they try, even in legal ways, to, to make it difficult for organization to deal with, with the Nakba, um, to not allow it's not that it's illegal to talk about the Nakba, but uh, it will make it difficult for organization to, to, to get financially and, uh, and also put some legal restrictions and, and sometimes restrictions on demonstrations and such. Um, and the general atmosphere, the general message to the Israeli public that those, dealing with those things is, is it's like helping the enemy, just as, as uh, documenting the occupation, the sa same thing. These things are against our interest, and it's serving the enemy, and it's helping the terrorists. Um, one, one of your slides was on uh, uh, Kafir Brain. Uh, probably not pronouncing it right. I know Abuna Shakur came from that building. Yes, yes. What, you talked about the legal ruling said that they could return, yeah. but the government or the military, how did that, how did that play out? Yeah, in 48, the, mil the, mil the army told them to evacuate the village for two weeks uh, for some military operation, and they did, and then they were never allowed to go back. Um, and after two years of attempts to come back, they went to the, to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court Ruled that yes, they have the right to go back, but the 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 authorities never allowed that. They they made it a like a closed military zone. Never allowed them to, to come back. And since then, it, it's still an ongoing issue because they are Israeli citizens and they keep uh, advocating for return to the village. They they and another village. And, and um, there were several governments that tried to deal with it. The Rabin government at the time almost reached a solution with them. Uh, they, don't, they don't also want to compromise because they were offered some um, land instead and, and much less land than what used to have, and they refused. And they, they, still, they still fight for, for going back. And, and they go a lot to the church. They, conduct ceremonies there, they have summer camps for their youth, they, 
educate their children. That this is their village. They, they live in a like a host village already 60 years, 70 years, but they, they still have their identity as people from Kafir Birem, and they don't want to um, mix with the local uh, population of the host village. They maintain their identity and they keep the struggle. So I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, but I was surprised by Megiddo, which I had no idea it used to be a Palestinian village. Um, because in archaeology, you hear all the time about how great Megiddo is for archaeology because so many cultures crossed paths there. So they talk about it a lot and refer to it as Megiddo. So I'm wondering um, if you know to what extent the Hebrew names of these villages now um, permeate like the archaeological field and other academic fields related to history, etc. <laughs> in Megiddo, the, the archaeological yeah. site is not where the, the Palestinian village used to be oh, and, and okay. where the kibbutz yeah. is now. There is the, the hill of the, of the archaeological okay. uh, site and one mile away mm -hmm. there is where, where used to be the Palestinian village and now the kibbutz. Okay. About the names, you ask? Yeah, like do you know how to what extent it like it's entrenched, I guess, in archaeology? Do they tend to use the Hebrew names or the old Palestinian Arab names? Or do you know? It's okay if you don't know. <laughs> who, who use Israel? Um, no, archaeologists in general, like um, around the world. Yeah. Archaeologists generally look for yeah. ancient history, so they try to find the, the ancient names of the of the places. And sometimes the, the Palestinian villages, the name of the villages, help, help uh, the archaeologists to, to find the ancient names. Mm -hmm. Because the Palestinian names, the, Arab, the Arabic names usually, in many cases, preserved the ancient name, when cha changing it slightly over the generation. So through, through, through knowing the Palestinian name, this is one of the ways to identify ancient places from the Bible or from mm -hmm. other, other sources because the Palestinian name kept, kept the original name through the generations. <laughs> so can it be said that the erasures and distortions of Palestinian history result in erasures and distortions of still previous history as well? In what way? I think I'm trying to follow up on the question. Is that Abby? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. I think I'm <laughs> trying to follow up on the question that Abby just asked. I don't know. If the, if the Israeli status quo changes place names, erases history from the time when the land was Palestinian, does that result in distortions and erasures of still older history as well? Um, if I understand your answer to Abby's question correctly, I think that the answer is at least partially yes. Yes, partially yes. And, and even, for example, the members of the names committee, some of them supported to, to leave the Arabic names. They thought that this is part of the history of the country. And that, and as you said, it it can also lead us to to have to have greater knowledge about previous um, periods. And they said that erasing erasing the Arabic names will is erasure erasure of our knowledge of the history and geography. So yes, also through that, and also through demolitions that they did in 48, 49 of ancient quarters in uh, in Jaffa, in Tiberia, in, in Haifa. Places, Palestinian uh, quarters that that they were very ancient and lasted for a long time, so in the demolition because they, they didn't think the Palestinian past is important. But some of them also were remains of um, more pre previous periods. So yes, also in this sense. Mm 